Hey, everybody. Let's welcome Kelly McCann to the show. Kelly, I'm so excited to have you. I spoke on your summit last year and you have another summit coming up this year. And you're just such a wealth of knowledge with MCAS and histamine intolerance and all that stuff. And our audience loves that topic. So we're super excited to have you today. Thank you so much, ladies. I'm so happy to be here. Hey, everybody. Let's welcome Kelly McCann to the show. Kelly, I'm so excited to have you. I spoke on your summit last year and you have another summit coming up this year. And you're just such a wealth of knowledge with MCAS and histamine intolerance and all that stuff. And our audience loves that topic. So we're super excited to have you today. Thank you so much, ladies. I'm so happy to be here. So let's dive into MCAS because a lot of people um, listening know what it is, but there are definitely people who don't. So it stands for mast cell activation syndrome. So can you just give us a rundown of what that is? Probably one of the most complicated, complex uh, conditions out there. That's a mouthful in itself, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I think about it as a multi-system, meaning different systems in the body, multi-symptom. They usually have lots of check marks on your uh, your conditions, and it's allergic, inflammatory, and sometimes there's actually overgrowth in the presentations. Um, what does that mean? Well, some people will have lots of symptoms about fatigue, headaches, migraines, gastrointestinal issues. They may have skin issues, hives, itching, um, but it can be so many more symptoms than that. It can involve the nervous system, the vascular system. People can have um, psychiatric issues too, mental illness like depression, anxiety. I have patients with endometriosis and lots of um, female issues, bladder issues, interstitial cystitis, kind of any inflammatory condition and uh, in the body can be part of mast cell activation. But I really think the key is having multiple systems that are going awry uh, with allergic inflammatory symptoms. Yeah. And I know that that's how Dr. Afrin explains it, right? Multiple systems having different symptoms. And that's also why it's so tricky to diagnose because, you know, especially if you're going through a conventional system, you're going to go see the gastroenterologist and then the dermatologist and the neurologist, you know, and they're all, they're not going to be talking to each other and putting all the pieces together. So it's why it's really important to get this topic out there because it is really hard for people to understand what this is. It's really hard to get a diagnosis from your doctor. It's oh, really yeah. confusing. So yeah. confusing. Um, I got a letter uh, from an allergist recently about a patient whom I am highly suspicious has mast cell activation. And the first thing he says is, well, I don't think that you have mast cell activation because your tryptase levels are normal. Uh, and it's so frustrating, you know, um, with Dr. Afrin, we talk about consensus one and consensus two. So consensus one is in the allergy world, a group of doctors got together and they wrote a, uh, what they called the consensus. Now, um, they didn't invite other people to their party when they wrote the article, but essentially they said there's very, very strict criteria that you have to meet in order to be given the diagnosis of mast cell activation has to do with tryptase and increased tryptase when you're having a flare versus your baseline. Well, that's not really adequate to yeah. clinically identify patients. And so Dr. Afrin, myself, and 40 other of our esteemed colleagues um, wrote what we call consensus two, which really delineates the difference between clinical presentation and some of the lab values that you can use to support that, maybe some of the biopsy um, information where you can do special stains for mast cell activation. But remember, there are thousands of mediators in mast cells, mm -hmm. and we can test for probably like half a dozen to maybe 10. Right. So we're looking for a needle in a haystack 
Um, and it's really more important to pay attention to the story, pay attention to somebody's history and presentation. That's where the money is. That's where the diagnosis is. Yeah, yeah. we see triptase being the only marker check sometimes with people who mm -hmm. come to us and they're like, well, I was, my doctor told me I don't have this because my triptase is normal. And I'm like, most people are not going to get a high trip taste. It's really hard to get a high trip taste. So. Even with someone in a significant flare too, yeah. it's, it's not always going to happen. Yeah. So it's, that's an important point. Yes. I have, um, you know, fortunately in life of knowing about mast cell activation, I have one patient who I did check the triptase and it was like 80. And I thought, oh my goodness, wow. well, this gentleman doesn't have mast cell activation. Wow. He actually has mastocytosis, yeah. which is very rare, uh, one in 10,000. Uh, but fortunately, because of my understanding of mast cell, we were able to diagnose him. Usually it takes um, years and years to get that diagnosis. So yeah. fortunately for him, he's on treatment, he's doing uh, well, but, um, you know, just that's my experience with triptase is, you know, I have a whole panel, a whole practice, and I'm sure you guys do too, yeah. of patients with mast cell and no elevation in their triptase. No, I've only seen it elevated with mastocytosis ever. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's wild. Yeah. So with the shortcomings of diagnosis, what are some of the things that you're finding with mast cell activation syndrome? When someone comes to you, what are some of the symptoms that you're seeing? Some of the symptoms that I mentioned, but it's really that uh, hypersensitivity reaction. Oftentimes in the history, they'll have some allergies, but it just keeps getting worse and worse. The amounts of um, food, the variety of food gets smaller and smaller and smaller. They're eating, you know, like half a dozen, hopefully a dozen foods, but, um, but it gets more and more restrictive. Um, many of the patients recently are sharing that, you know, they're sensitive to EMF. They know that they're in mold. Um, they're sensitive to molds. Some of them can't go into buildings. They have gotten rid of all the fragrance in their personal care products. They have to do a fragrance detox of their entire house. Nobody in the house can uh, wear any uh, fragrance or um, just things like that. The light, yeah. unfortunately, people's lives, when they don't know what's happening to them, they get more and more and more restrictive. It's really sad and unfortunate that there are more practitioners out there who can help and who can identify this. So I'm so glad that you ladies are getting the word out, uh, to help more patients. Yeah. Cause it's needed. It's, it's especially after COVID. I mean, we see it oh. so much. So in addition to mold, we know mold is one of the biggest triggers I'd say for uh, mass activation. What, what have you seen uh, else that can like drive this and lead to this? Um, a lot of chronic infections, particularly mm -hmm. Bartonella, um, you know, Bartonella doesn't get a lot of press, but that's cat scratch fever. And it can often be what we call a co-infection with Lyme disease. So we talk about Lyme disease as it's this one thing, mm -hmm. but many times it's multiple infections. So people may get a tick bite, they can get it congenitally and it's an infection it's usually several infections and that, um, that can trigger mast cell activation. And, you know, it's important to remember that mast cells are our friends. Mm -hmm. They are part of our immune system and what their job is to fight foreign invaders. And so we want them to respond. It just so happens that sometimes they get a little wonky, right? And they overdo. <laughs> So many of us are perfectionists and we work really hard and we overdo. Any of you guys done that? Oh my, <laughs> I can name a few. <laughs> All right. So we overdo. Okay. So our mast cells are just reflecting our overdoingness and they're dumping all their inflammatory mediators in a attempt to help us out. And yet it's, it's, um, uh, 
causing all of this distress and all of these symptoms, um, because they're doing their job. Um, other things that can trigger mast cell activation, certainly EMF, um, so electromagnetic frequencies, things like Wi-Fi, um, dirty electricity, but actually, you know, with EMF, it's, it's really the electrical wiring in the house that can be most problematic for people. Um, so when I, I find when patients turn off the, not only turn off the router and put their phone in airplane mode, but turn off the electrical to their bedrooms and create an EMF free sanctuary. That's when they really tend to do much better. Um, and then environmental chemicals, mm -hmm. you know, we are so steeped, unfortunately, in environmental chemicals. Um, it's not just pesticides, it's flame retardants, it's plastics, it's um, all of the heavy metals and toxic metals. You know, I can go on and on and on about yeah. all the triggers. Um, some of the biggest environmental exposures that we have are actually in our homes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, most people don't realize it, but building materials, the VOCs and paints, if you put down a new carpet or a new kind of flooring, and then we're, you know, we build with, with products um, that are just full of chemicals. Think about particle board and the formaldehyde yeah. in the particle board. Um, those things can trigger mass cell activation because they're not natural. Right. And it's yeah. crazy too, because, you know, these patients, they're so sensitive, they're so sick and then they get, so their limbic systems just completely dysregulated. And then you're, we need to share all this information with them, right. With what's, what they're exposed to in their homes. So then that's overwhelming them more. So it's just this huge hamster wheel. Don't you find this, especially with Marcel, it's, it's really tough and it's heartbreaking. What triggers, you know, keeps them sick too. And then it overwhelms them with the things they need to do to get better. So it is. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, think about it. Like you're in a moldy environment, uh, maybe it's an older home or an older apartment, and then you move to a brand new place because you think, oh, I'll avoid the mold. And then you just add to your exposures because of all the chemicals in the building material. Um, so it is really hard. And, and you know, I, I, I think about the mast cell activation and what's happening with the limbic system as really, if we think about it as a three-legged stool, right? So you've got your mast cells on one leg, and then, you, um, then you've got your vagus nerve and your autonomic nervous system on the other leg. And then the third leg is your limbic system. And for the, those people who are in a situation where they can't move um, or they can't take any supplements, we really need to work on the other two legs yeah. uh, and do our best to work on the mast cell, but it's going to be regulating that, that nervous system in addition to calming down the mast cells that is going to help push that needle. Yeah, it's so true. And when we work with really, I mean, we do this with everyone, but when, especially when we get really sensitive patients, we have them do limbic system work first. We are like, we're not touching supplements or anything like that. We want to work, you know, do this first and let's get your body to calm down, you know, a little bit. And it does make such a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it's actually really fun, I think, to uh, watch people go through this transformation because it opens up the door to really understanding like, how is it that I am in the world that isn't really serving me anymore? Am I, um, am I a perfectionist? Am I, um, doing for everybody else? And now my body is saying, Nope, you can't do that anymore. And so I need to figure out how to be in this world in a different way. Yeah. Take another day at a time with them. Right. Mm-hmm. So let's kind of talk a little bit more about mold because it's just kind oh. of everywhere. It seems like it's driving so many things. 
but you don't really hear exactly how mold can impact your hormones. So can you kind of explain that to us? Sure. Um, so you want me to talk specifically about mold and hormones? Well, how is how it disrupts your hormones and how that can aggravate those with mast cell issues? I find that mold has a couple of effects on the hormones. One is that people can actually develop a sensitivity to their own hormones, um, especially progesterone. Mm -hmm. Um, So many times patients will come in with a lot of um, complaints. If they're menstruating, um, they might have terrible PMS, lots of cramping, lots of um, issues around the menstrual cycle. And it's it's really interesting. I'm able to do testing with my colleague, Dr. Darren Ingalls. And I we are, Darren. I know he's so wonderful. Yeah, he is. Um, and we're able to pinpoint if they're sensitive to estrogen or progesterone. And oftentimes it's progesterone. Mm-hmm. I had one young woman, she would get hives every menstrual cycle, you know, full body hives, chronic fatigue about four days right before her cycle. And if we think about the menstrual cycle, you have a peak of estrogen on day 12, and then a peak of progesterone on day 21. And then if there's no egg, you know, everything uh, sloughs off. Um, And that peak of progesterone can in your, if you're sensitive to progesterone, it's like an amplifier on all of the symptoms that progesterone has. Um, and, and then the cool thing with working with Dr. Ingalls is we get to do immunotherapy to the hormones that people are reacting to. It's so cool. So that young woman who had hives and, you know, couldn't go to school because she was so debilitated, um, and fatigued, she has normal menstrual cycles. Now she has, she doesn't take any Zyrtec. She doesn't have to, she lives her normal life, uh, with regular periods, no PMS, no, you know, debilitating cramps. It's amazing. Um, so that's one of the things that I see. Um, the other thing that I see is just that people stop menstruating, uh, or for men, their testosterone levels tank there's nothing normal about a 20 or a 30 year old man with testosterone in the two hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Testosterone levels should be 800, a thousand. And, um, and this is often what times what I will see with, um, younger people when they're in a moldy environment. Um, and, you know, lack of estrogen, (laughs) lack of hormones when you're in your twenties and thirties makes you feel terrible. Terrible. You know, you feel terrible when you're 50 and you have (laughs) hormones. So you can't imagine what it feels like in your twenties and Mm thirties. Um, so that's usually what I find is that when things are really extreme, um, either you'll have this dysregulation and almost an immune response to your hormones or, um, virtually none. Um, and when we do testing for follicle stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone in the brain, it's not that they're postmenopausal, you know, they actually have adequate levels of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They're just not making enough hormones to have a cycle. So crazy how it all works Mm -hmm. together. It really is. It's, it's wild. The body is very smart. (laughs) It is very smart. I mean, the body knows, Hey, this is not a good time, not great circumstances in which to be able to make a baby. So we're just going to shut it all down. Yeah. Yeah. And with the progesterone too, I, I can't tell you how many people would come to the practice and be on progesterone. And they're like, I I can't take this. It's causing hives. It's, you know, and it's not everybody, right? No, it's not everybody. Yeah. But I definitely have made that connection too, with you talking about that. It's, it's very interesting. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. We see a lot of interstitial cystitis too, you know, in the hormonal picture with that. Can you, and with MCAS, can you go into that a little bit for women listening, struggling with that? 
Sure. Okay. This is my new favorite thing to talk about. It's a little complicated, but it's absolutely fascinating. So there are two main pieces besides MCAS that we need to address when people have interstitial cystitis or even just urinary frequency, right? So a lot of the symptoms of mold exposure, um, there's a change in the ADH that Richie Shoemaker taught us. And so people get this urinary frequency, they might have um, nocturia or they're getting up at night to go to the bathroom and they don't even have full-blown interstitial cystitis. But it turns out that the bladder is not sterile. You know, we're taught in medical school and the gold standard in conventional medicine is a urinalysis and urine culture. And if you don't have a positive culture, you don't have a bladder infection. Yeah. And yet if you actually, and the, the technology for urinary culture is 40 years old. Yeah. Wow. We're using a 40 year old technology to make this diagnosis. That's insane, right? We have such better technology these days. Um, so there are companies that do what's called next generation sequencing. The one that I like to use is called MicroGen DX. And they, what next generation sequencing is, is a library of thousands of different organisms. And so you take a specimen and you compare the DNA in the specimen to what's in your library and figure out exactly what organisms are present in the bladder. Wow. Um, and then they give you the sensitivities so you can actually treat the infections. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. That's good. It is so good. It's so good. And um, the other thing that conventional medicine has not really kept up with is this idea of biofilms. Mm -hmm. So we know about biofilms from Lyme disease. The biofilms are this protective force field that will, uh, that the bacteria live in, right? It's like their home. They hang out in this biofilm. It's like a force field. And everywhere that there's bacteria, there are biofilms. So we have biofilm in our gastrointestinal tract, we have biofilm in our sinuses, and guess what? There's biofilm in the bladder too. So what has to happen in order to get adequate uh, sampling for the microgen DX test is we have to give people biofilm busters, break up enough of the biofilm so you can actually see the bacteria that's there. And then on top of that, um, what hap What I'm finding is that in people who have chronic illness, they also have a predisposition to making clots. Mm -hmm. And then what happens with the biofilms is the building blocks of clots called fibrin get incorporated into the biofilm. So now you've got this mucopolysaccharide force field that the bacteria are making, which is reinforced by the fibrin in people who have this genetic predisposition to making clots. <clears throat> and 90% of the patients in my practice have some form of genetic predisposition to making clots. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, that's um, so we give biofilm busters, we give fibrinolytics, proteins that break down the extra fibrin, and then we check the microgen DX and we find out what's there. And it's been a game changer, absolute game changer. So folks who have had chronic symptoms for years, they have layers and layers and layers of biofilm and bacteria. Um, I have a, a woman in her, you know, kind of late forties, uh, former nurse on disability had so many symptoms, Lyme, mold, mast cell, you know, so many symptoms. And we did the micro gen DX test and treated her appropriately. Um, and within a couple of rounds of antibiotics, she's 80% better across the board. Wow. 80% better, joint pain better, fatigue better, everything is better because this is a source of an inflammation in the body. The body knows it's not supposed to be there. 
and it's causing rampant inflammation. And when we actually address it and get rid of it, people get so much better. I had a, a fireman in his fifties who would have to keep a, you know, water bottle or a soda can in his, uh, truck because he had to urinate so urgently. He yeah. never knew when he was going to be going to have to do this. And he couldn't always find a bathroom in time. That's not normal folks. No, <laughs> no. Right. but he has this increased risk for clotting and he's not, he, like, I think he's in mold, but he doesn't have any, like, he's a healthy guy, right? He's working yeah. as a fireman, um, but doing a couple rounds of antibiotics and cleaning up his biofilm uh, colonization in his bladder, all those symptoms are gone. It's pretty awesome. That's that so is cool. Very awesome. What about like the dysautonomias and Eller Danlos syndrome? You know, how it, it can be all kind of come together with MCAS. You, I'm sure you see that a lot. I do. Um, so remember that some of the mediators that the mast cells produce are enzymes. And elastase 2 is one of those enzymes that could produce by mast cells. Um, and so if somebody already has uh, inherited uh, Ellos Danlor syndrome, whether it's hypermobile or somewhere on the spectrum, and they get exposed to mold, get exposed to Lyme disease, all of the triggers, and then they have mast cells that are now spilling out more inflammatory meteors, especially elastase 2, which is then chewing up their. <clears throat> their connective tissue, they're going to develop worsening hypermobility, which is then going to um, make their joint pain worse, make their neck uh, stability worse, potentially worsening their um, vagus nerve function, which can then exacerbate the autonomic nervous system function and their, their vagus nerve issues and their POTS. So that's yeah. one of the ways that that can happen. Um, you know, and I also think about it very simplistically, like when we have, when somebody has a hypermobility, their connective tissue is more lax. Um, if you have, you know, strong connective tissue and all the, the fibers are interlinked and close the way that they're, you know, they are in non-hypermobile non-hypermobile patients, um, there's less space for the toxins and the infections to kind of burrow in. But if you have more laxity, look, look there's plenty of space for the Lyme disease to just burrow. Yeah. In. It's, it's way such in. a good point. Mm -hmm. What Here. about Dr. Maxwell's spiky leaky syndrome? I've heard you talk about that before. Yeah. I think he's really onto something there. Um, it's, I, I definitely have seen it in some of my patients. Um, you know, it becomes this feed forward loop that's just really challenging for patients. Um, there's environmental chemicals driving the mast cell. There's, you know, mold driving the mast cell. And that um, hypermobility just gets worse and worse. Yeah. yeah. So if some, for listeners listening, you know, where, and they're extremely sensitive, where do you start with patients? Because as you know, as we all know, working with so many over the years, you, you got to go really slow with patients because of these sensitivities. So kind of walk someone through that process with what, how you work with patients. Sure. I'd be happy to, you know, everyone is so different. I think that the, the most important thing that a practitioner can do or that a patient can request of the practitioner is to really listen because mm -hmm. they're going to tell me the patients tell me where to start. Yeah. They usually have come and if they've tried every supplement, maybe there's some compounded prescriptions that they haven't tried. If they've tried, um, a variety of different, um, you know, say they did DNRS and it didn't work for them and they, 
then maybe we start with some vagus nerve exercises. Um, and, and even within each category of things to try, I, I want people to look at the, look at a group of different things. You know, I'll give people like a dozen different uh, vagus nerve stimulation ideas. And then I want them to pick the one that resonates with them. Right. Yeah. I, I can't, I don't know. Yeah. Brain tap can be fantastic for some people, but for other people, those flashing lights are just way over the top. I could never use it. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's where I start is listening and then providing options for people, you know, I really think that when folks are struggling with chronic illness, their bodies are speaking to them. Mm -hmm. And what my job is, is to help them start to learn the language of their body. What is your body really trying to tell you? And how can you start to listen to it and, and make the shifts that you need to make so that um, so that you can really start to heal. And I want them to feel empowered. You know, it's not about me. I'm like the coach and the guide, but I don't have all the answers in many ways. Each individual person has the best answer for them. So I am actually teaching, um, how to do muscle testing. If they're interested in that, you know, if I have 70 different supplements and, you know, dozens of pharmaceuticals, how the heck am I going to know which is the best one for you? Right. Yeah. Why don't we ask your body, ask your immune system, ask your intuition. And if you're not confident that you can access that, well, then that's where we start. Yeah. 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 It's good it to does. have options too. Like you said, for some people, they love, you know, the Gupta program or whatever, you know, program you put them on. And for some people, they're like, this is yeah. not for me, yeah. you know, and you have to yeah. have different ways for them to um, see what works for them. So that's such a good point. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I, I have patients um, who, well, and you, do, I'm sure you do too, right? That cognitively, they yeah. don't, they have too much brain fog. They can't jump in and do like even two minutes of meditation, let alone uh, an hour of meditation. Um, and many people, you know, my patients have shared this over the years too. The limbic system retraining programs are asking you to find your joy, like yeah. envision your happy place. Well, when you've been sick for a long period of time, happiness just feels kind of out of reach. And it's like, yeah. okay, I'm doing these exercises, but this isn't really working for me because there's no joy in here. And so we start somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and then other people love the resi max, but some people, just can't do the resi max. That vibration is too much for them. So finding, finding what works for each individual. That's how I start. Yeah. yeah. Very that. individual. We love that. Absolutely. Well, you have a summit, um, coming up all about this and some really amazing speakers. You co-host this with Beth O'Hara, right? Yes. And I was lucky enough to be asked to speak on this as well. So can you tell us about the summit? Tell it what, tell us when it is. And we'll put a link in the show notes too, for you guys. It's a free event. So when is it and what, it, what can we expect to, you know, see in there? Yes. Thank you, uh, Becky. So it's mastering mast cell activation syndrome summit. It launches October 16th through the 22nd with an encore weekend, the 29th and 30th, I think. And it's a free seven day event. You can sign up and watch as many of the, the videos as you want, including your wonderful video with Beth. Um, so Beth and I, have um, shared their responsibilities of doing these interviews. And we have just a wealth of information for you. I'm so excited for this event. We talked to a variety of different people, some of the same speakers, but we've talking new concepts with them. Um, 
I did a round table with Beth and um, Tom Moorcroft and Darren Ingalls talking about Lyme disease and chronic infections. Um, Beth and I interviewed Neil Nathan, who's a favorite and somebody who knows a ton about mast cell activation. Of course, we talked to Dr. Uh, Thea Herides and Dr. Afrin. Mary Ackerley and I have this fantastic discussion about oxytocin. Oh, wow. I Very love cool. Oxytocin. It's so cool. It's a mast cell stabilizer. You know, this is, this is the cuddle hormone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's all about, uh, oh, and oxytocin has been around for like 6 million years. Every single mammal on the planet, even the invertebrates have oxytocin. Um, and, you know, I think when we're talking about mast cell patients, we feel, we feel isolated, uh, we're lonely, we feel misunderstood. Who doesn't need a little bit of love in their life and a little bit of, you know, that nurturing self-love. So, um, and, the, and there's so many other benefits on top of that. And it also helps with urinary frequency um, and anxiety and a little bit of libido. So, yeah, love oxytocin. Please check out that. Um, little plug for oxytocin. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, just a ton of fantastic information and um, definitely different from both Beth's summit last year and my summit last year. So please check it out. Yeah. And we'll just go down to the show notes and you'll see a link where you can register. So where else can people find you? I have a brick and mortar practice called the spring center in Southern California. Um, you do have to come to California in order to establish with me. Um, I do see patients from some States, depending upon the state, uh, I have licenses in a variety of other States besides California. So, um, you can check out the website and I do have a personal website, drkellymccann.com where I have blogs and, um, and a course, on mast cell activation and environmental chemicals. Very so cool. awesome. That's yes. so exciting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, for coming on. You're just oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I know there's so much more information that you have. So check out her website and her course and the summit. And thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, if you can pop over and leave a review, that would be awesome. You can also find us over at healthbabes.com where you can find our courses, our latest book. We also are on Instagram at the health babes, at Dr. Becky Campbell or at Dr. Crystal Home. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.